sorry, I overlooked that. Uh, good to see everyone, or good to, good to notice that others are there. And um, shall we begin, panel? We should. And I'll, I'll yeah. introduce the, the first of our speakers. So um, welcome all you out in the world. And uh, thank you for joining us for this session on, on uh, lessons and examples from religion and media and cultural habits, what we have come to call in search of teachable moments. And our first speaker, I'm very happy to introduce uh, James Akpan, who is a PhD student in psychology at the University of West Florida with a strong interest in history and religion. He was born in Nigeria and did his uh, double bachelor's degree in philosophy and theology there. Then he came to the United States to earn a master's degree in theology and religious studies at St. John's University in New York, New York. His MA thesis won the first place graduate division there during the 2018 annual research month. And he's working up a dissertation on the psychology of homeland cultures, which I'm eager to learn more about, as part of his contribution toward the cultural growth of Africa. So let's turn the digital floor over to James Akpan. Thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. Um, I want to share my PowerPoint so we could start. Okay. Uh, okay, I hope I'm clicking the right so yeah, okay. Yes. All right, okay. so uh, let's begin. Thank you for joining us, participants and everyone out there. Um, COVID-19, birthing a new psychology of religion through the works of Piaget and Wink. So I, I didn't find any more appropriate words to start my paper than the words of Brené Brown. In these uncertain and risky moments of vulnerability, I search for inspiration from the brave innovators and disruptors whose courage feels contagious. And I tag Jean Piaget as a brave innovator and Walter Wink as a disruptor because of their respective areas of interest and how that contributes to my work here. So overall, my paper is a theoretical answer to the question, what has COVID-19 impresses upon our minds regarding religion? So the structure of the paper is very simple. We'll talk about the crisis in the global village and how it is perceived in different regions and particularly in America and Nigeria where I am very connected. And we also look at Piaget and Wink and their respective contribution and then summary and conclusion. So what the crisis, I go to the next slide, what the crisis revealed. First, the local responses. Um, there is uh, the diathesis model, diathesis stress model in psychology, which in my own personal way, I don't have any other way of describing it than the salt solution. You put some salt in water and you see the color of the water changing a little bit, but at some point you put one teaspoon in it and everything goes down. So that's called predispositional vulnerabilities. Stress is a part of life, but there is a point that everything gets crumbled. And so, so we have these predispositional vulnerabilities in societies, in world communities that are showing up very clearly in the response in uh, the current pandemic. So in America, social distancing was very easy to observe and uh, stimulus, stimulus checks were distributed very orderly. In Nigeria, it wasn't the same. It was different. There were mal malpractices from contact from home that I've connected with. And we saw on TVs that there were chaos everywhere where food was distributed. So you see how what we already know about cultures, how they precipitate at this time of 
and the crisis. So, but what, are, what do all this mean? They call our attention to what is called global. I had to go back to what globalization, how it all started. And I saw that it started in colleges, business administration departments, where students learned how to sell goods beyond boundaries. So it could be a one way kind of traffic. But then it also took me to one author, Roth, who talks about the A, the B, and the C. The A is our individual nature. The B is the social, and the C is the societal. In cultures like the two cultures, America and, and, and Africa, it's very difficult to say something about societal. But in German cultures and things like that, places like that, the societal comes very clearly. So these responses shows me that uh, my nation of Nigeria might not reach the societal level where things are organized more than the social and the individual. So what the crisis also revealed uh, was um, coping mechanisms that people shared on social media, people encourage each other, like this bottom right picture. Um, I miss those days when I sneeze. I will hear, I just copied the way it was. I will hear, bless you. But now it's back to sender, Holy Ghost fire. That's typical Nigerian post. Holy Ghost fire is something opposite of bless you. But a little sense of humor, a little sense of admonition, a little sense of spiritual upliftment there. Next slide. So what does the pandemic mean to cultures, uh, to people who are very religious? People might begin to think of the a precipitational effect like manifestation of evil, which um, the Bible talks about. And by the way, I'm looking at the Christian Catholic background, African background too. So you, you have many instances where crises are misinterpreted in the Bible and scapegoating scapegoatism um, would be a kind of um, a way out of those uh, situations. But even after the biblical age, in the age of enlightenment, 17th to 19th centuries, we saw people still scapegoating people. We have Salem witch trials, which took place in the 17th century. And the religious atmosphere played a key role. People were accusing and counter accusing each other we also have the tuberculosis crisis. That one was even two centuries later in the 19th century where dead members of families were exhumed and even punished and burned. So you see how human beings tend to misinterpret crisis, but the religious atmosphere also contributed. So in my judgment, die hard religious, and by religious, I mean group-like interpretations can Ex exacerbate crisis because it always involves a top-down pattern of explanation which doesn't consider the horizontal. So there might still be wrong interpretations of crisis at this time. Go to the next slide. So how does Piaget come in? Piaget is known as the fourth most influential psychologist and his uh, concept of accumulation is interpreted to mean change and assimilation to mean growth. There are schemas which we interpose on what we do. Some information out there we assimilate because they feed into our parents. Others, we just, uh, okay, we accommodate. All right, so, so, but it's very difficult to say the line, to draw the line between the two. But for the religious minded people, crisis can be a moment to change like repent, like we've been doing this, that like God is warning us and all that. But the, for, the so, for the not so religious might be a call for change. And by the way, Piaget was accused in quote, of, being to, of leaning towards the assimilatory, even though he said there's no line between the two. Because of his interest in science, because of the role of the subject, the subject would always report in the third person, which we already know in science, most evidence is third person. And then Piaget was looking at that also. So, but crisis has a role in both accommodation and assimilation. So another, another concept by Piaget 
is a queer liberation which links assimilation and accommodation to personality development and motivation. Earlier on, accommodation and assimilation was seen in the child developmental stage where children learn by assimilating and accommodating information, but then a queer liberation links the two to show that uh, a whole of personality, the whole life and motivation can um, be interpreted in, uh, with the two concepts. So, so um, and self-regulation is um, the modality where queer liberation functions and it's central to learning. And of course, the queer liberation has to do with balancing, but since they are not opposing forces, accommodation and simulation are not opposing forces, so it's not just balancing opposites. It's about what is important at the moment. And Piagetian authors also see that the queer liberation is um, an expression of the biological foundation of human development because it's inherent in us to understand, motivation to understand. So the good thing is that when you interpose, when you superimpose the queer liberation on society, you see that there is there is um, a space for everyone, both religious oriented and science oriented people. All right, so why did I bring in Walter Wink? Walter Wink came into my presentation because of, because of his um, emphasis on the horizontal. So his idea of the devil is very revolutionary. And of course, in the Bible, some people don't read it well. So Walter Wing is calling our attention. For instance, two portions of the Bible, First Chronicles and Second Samuel, says exactly the same thing. But Satan is in one and God is in the other. So that was the beginning of Walter Wing's looking at the horizontal nature of the devil. That the devil might be a function and not merely a personality representing our collective voice of condemnation, and there is always some truth in the charges. That reminds me of Socrates, uh, man, know thyself. So there's always a voice in us that is saying, we are doing well, we're not doing well. All right, so in the context of my work, what does COVID-19 mean? I call that a festival of continuums. Uh, top, top of the... Uh, slide, you have a figure that has to do with the biblical understanding of God, which I brought into this. And of course, the Christian Bible incorporates the Jewish Old Testament, the Jewish Bible and our Bible. And there was a time God was not seen. And I dare to say God is seen now. So the top to, top to down bottom is a little bit skewed. To my bottom left is Walter, Walter Wing's figure himself. Uh, seeing the devil as a good guy and the devil as the bad guy. The bad guy is mostly in the New Testament with Paul and the gospel writers, but the few portions of the Old Testament that he examines sees uh, the devil as collaborative personality, collaborative agency, sort of like um, district attorney. <laughs> That's what he says. So, and then the, to the bottom right is, I just put that together. Again, in the Bible, there's a definition of faith as evidence of things unseen. So now, science can come in as evidence of things seen. And that shows what reality is. So that also shows where we can fit in, in that continuum. All right, so what critical landscape is opened by coronavirus in religious settings? All right, so I've heard, I wasn't here, but I've heard that people were running to churches. <clears throat> Excuse me after 9-11 and the assassination of uh, John Kennedy, president. But what is the direction now? Okay, and also we, are, we can also look at the human limitations. God is always present as worshiped, but is he a healer? Because people used to, in my African background, people go to church to be healed. But now with social distancing, what image of God are we having? The Bible talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth, which was exactly what we did in some places with streaming online. That is also a critical thing to look at. Um, a psychological inquiry into the beginnings of formal worship. How did formal worship start? When people are fighting one another, is God, is the image of God, like Narcissus, who was killing people who were dying and still was 
uh, bent on looking at his self-image. All right, there's one German author, Bonhoeffer, who talks about religionless Christianity. And it's, that means groupless and personal, more personal uh, living of the faith, more personal. All right, it also opens up a critical view of a cultural historical basis of religion. Um, we can look at the ethnic basis of all the world religions. And for me, it's also a moment for Africa to look at some terms, post-colonial terms like enculturation. All right, so what do we do with the new psychology of religion with Piaget and Wink? Well, the heart of religious practices is the human and natural endowment of self-transcendence, a part of which is the motivation to understand. So we can, if we apply Piaget to society, so self-transcendence in the religious mind that people can give birth to faith, hope, and love of neighbor. And for the non-so religious can be care for people and obedience to the law. Again, the line is hard to draw. It doesn't mean that the other group doesn't obey the law. And also we can benefit from wink by looking at the devil, not as the bad guy. Christ is not as the bad thing, but something for us to grow. So both also make us to move from ca categorical thinking to dimensional thinking. By category, I mean group, overwhelming, like gullible acceptance of things and not critically looking at it. All right, so I'm moving to the end of my slides. All right, so I hope I'm doing well with time. All right, so um, during this crisis, the phrase that was very common was, you are not standing alone. In one of CBS 46 News, I even saw a man dressed in Roman color who said the same thing, you're not standing alone. So, but then houses of worship were empty. So how are we standing? Okay, so, but that was, that is a coping mechanism for all. Um, in looking at COVID-19 and religion, I would think that people were fighting about their religious affiliations especially places, third world countries like my country, where Muslim and Christians can, um, can clash. It will be anachronistic to keep fighting after this because this has taught us a more mature way of knowing what is important in life. So for me, assimilating religion does not mean Phariseeism, that is to be Pharisee, sake, to be hyper-religious. It rather means spirituality and faith what Cardinal John Newman calls real ascent. And accommodating does not mean lack of capacity for self-transcendence. It rather means other worthy causes of society. For instance, that people who are not affiliated with religion, but they love their country, they love each other. So love is all that matters. And in the words of Piagetian authors, we are called to assimilate if we can or accommodate if we must. Thank you so much. That's my work. Thank you, James. Thank Great. you. Great. And we worked out so that now our first presenter could introduce our second one. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, so I am introducing Z. Gao. Z is a postdoctorate fellow in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Simon Fraser University, Vancouver. Currently, he studies Chinese immigrants, mental health, sense of own belonging or belonging, and experience of racism amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the Canada-China tensions. In addition, Z has published on the history of psychology and human sciences in China's socialist movement, as well as how contemporary Chinese experience social conflict. Welcome, Z. Thank you, 
James, very much for your beautiful presentation and uh, your introduction. Uh, let me just get my um, share screen working. All right, it seems to be sharing now. Okay, uh, yeah, my topic will be a lot more worldly. I will be uh, focusing on the uh, the the the, uh, the role of uh, China uh, in uh, the process of the uh, deglobalization. So during the COVID nineteen pandemic, many countries implemented the lockdown measures by reducing international transportation and the trade. Also, there have been widespread mutual accusations and the lack of a cooperation between countries. All these phenomena indicate that the COVID crisis is accelerating the process of deglobalization. Against this backdrop, okay, um, okay, um, I have been studying China's role in deglobalization. I trust that most of you are aware of China's ambitious Belt and the Road Initiative, a multi-trillion dollar project of infrastructure development and uh, investment through which China attempts to expand its global power. China's rise has received a consider considerable backlash from the Western world, most notably during uh, using the trade war. The COVID-19 pandemic once again positioned China on the hotspot. The disputes often extended to China's political ideologies, including authoritarianism and the neglect of human rights. In this presentation, I focus on transnational media. Transnational media are defined as media that address audiences beyond and, and across national borders. Due to globalization and immigration, transnational media have played an increasingly prominent role in how people stay in touch with international news. The rise of international media brings with it both hope and challenge. Taking the European Union, for example, transnational media promise to bring various countries together towards pan-Europeanism. Meanwhile, there has been a fear that transnational media have the potential to Americanize European culture. My research on Chinese transnational media, CTM for short, leans to the concerning site. CTM links overseas Chinese with the mainland China through their shared lingual cultural background and socioeconomic connections. Thus, even though CTM are typically hosted by Chinese diasporas and a target audience living there, they often share China's recent rising nationalism. Among the wider range of the CTM, I concentrate on the group of anti-Western CTM, uh, which have been creating more conflict than mutual understanding. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a new social and existential conditions for Chinese immigrants. Under the acute and pervasive threat from the coronavirus, whether the host society can promise a security has come to influence Chinese immigrants' sense of belonging. CTM has nimbly tapped into the practical and existential needs of Chinese immigrants during the crisis and intensified their coverage of public health approaches to COVID-19, often highlighting the differences between the Chinese approach and the Western approach. I argue that such media portrayals often touch on the administrative capacity of various governments, on human rights, and on the implications of liberal citizenship for public health. Those are all key topics of dispute in China's tension with the Western world. In so doing, CTM exerts much influence on Chinese immigrants' sense of security and belonging. Further, I argue that various common media strategies, such as disinformation and othering, adaptly tap into cultural differences regarding, for example, one's sense of privacy, conformity to the government, and the habit of wearing face masks. I based my study on two sets of data collected between January and uh, uh, May this year. 
The first data is comprised of a CTM in the form of a digital newspaper, um, online forums, and social media. The second data set comes from my field work on Chinese immigrants' use of media. Since I conducted a great proportion of the field work online, my observation pretty much covers all major trends um, in European and Anglo-Saxon countries. I use discourse analysis and a narrative analysis to process my data. During the COVID-19 pandemic, overseas Chinese in European and Anglo-Saxon countries found themselves torn between two approaches to public health, one in China and one in their host societies. The Chinese approach forcefully restricted people's mobility by banning the use of private vehicles, setting up checkpoints outside of residential buildings, and implementing mass surveillance. CTM played down the numerous tragedies resulting from the harsh lockdown, while highlighting the Chinese government's determination to stamp out the virus. In comparison with this forceful approach, Chinese immigrants saw their host country's governments as being lamentably sluggish and irresolute. This perception is not unwarranted. The problem, however, is that a CTM displayed a little willingness to explore Western countries' general strategy uh, that we call flattening the curve. In many CTM reports, the rationale behind such a strategy, namely that it is impossible to fully eradicate the highly contagious virus in today's globalized world, was simply missing. CDM's suspicion of uh, Western strategy was bolstered by the contrast that while China had largely put its epidemic under control, new epicenters were emerging in the West. Drawing on this contrast, CDM reproduced the discourse from China that Western countries should copy China's homework. The idea of a copy in China's homework is highly problematic in that it not only flippantly ignores the tremendous suffering brought on by COVID-19, but also fails to recognize the historical, cultural, and the political factors that feed into various public health strategies. Regarding the Chinese approach, CTM largely omit the Chinese Communist Party's history of using mass mobilization to eliminate public health threats, as well as the fact that the party today has a gigantic membership of 90 million to exercise its unhampered power. Regarding the Western approaches, CTM tend to ignore or downplay the concerns of Western societies about human rights issues and the possibility that the governments might take advantage of this state of exception to expand their powers. Without adequate background information, readers are left with the impression that Western governments are simply irresponsible in not adopting the radical and seemingly effective measures undertaken by the Chinese government. If the aforementioned problems, the lack of a contextualization, partial representation, and ideological distortion originate from the lack of a professional competence, there is a second, more disconcerting category of problems that can be attributed to calculated disinformation. In the latter case, some CTM concocted fake news to demonize Western responses to the pandemic. Mr. New York, a popular CTM, recently sparked a major controversy. Its disinformation includes the charges that the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention stopped publicizing the number of diagnoses and the deaths, and that the sale of guns and ammunition in the U.S. increased by three times due to the epidemic. One source it draws from is Dr. Paul Cottrell, an American who has been spreading the conspiracy theory that the coronavirus was bioengineered. His LinkedIn web page describes him as being a future medical student. 
namely a candidate for a master's in biology at Harvard and a pre-medical student at Fordham. Mr. New York does have more formal sources. One argument it passionately defends is that the coronavirus originated in the United States rather than China. With this claim, Mr. New York not only exonerates China, but further asserts that China deserves gratitude from the whole world for its sacrifices made in containing the virus. This time, Mr. New York quotes tweets made by Chinese diplomats. The fact that those diplomats announced their charges using Twitter is noteworthy given that the Twitter is banned in China, making ordinary Chinese citizens who use it potentially subject to legal punishment. My field work shows that the CTM have received the support from uh, many Chinese immigrants, even though there was also a strong pushback. A study participant of mine, George, is a political refugee in Vancouver. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, he accused the Chinese government of allowing its military lab to produce the coronavirus, which was a popular conspiracy theory among Chinese political dissidents. After weeks, when the coronavirus spread to Canada, George transferred his lack of trust in the Chinese government to the Canadian one suspecting it of deliberately hiding the number of diagnoses and refusing to deliver enough tests. Those claims replicate exactly his criticisms of the Chinese government. In my exchange with George, I realized that under the influence of a CTM, the strategy of flattening the curve never impressed the George. His understanding of the Western strategy to COVID-19 was instead encapsulated in the controversial concept of herd immunity. While many Western scholars criticize herd immunity from a scientific perspective, George's criticism came from a different angle. According to him, the strategy was to deliberately let the plague run loose in order to eliminate hundreds of thousands of individuals who are old, weak, or unhealthy. Uh, such a social Darwinist portrayal wholly um, uh, neglects the Western government's call to protect the vulnerable individuals. The underlying accusation is that Western countries have failed to live up to their advocacy of human rights. This criticism might appear to resonate with many Westerners' concerns, but it eventually points to something other than a humanitarian goal. Ignoring similar calamities in China, CTM positioned China as the foremost champion of human rights that take good care of its vulnerable citizens. While holding Western governments at a fault for implementing a cruel herd immunity policy, George was equally skeptical of whether the liberal-minded local citizens could actually adhere to the quarantine standards. In mid-March, it was reported that Canada had carried out more than 55,000 COVID tests. George was suspicious of this number. One of the reasons behind his doubt is that individuals who suspect themselves of having caught the virus would need to voluntarily visit a hospital in order to get tested. China, in contrast, enforced the stricter measures including taking individuals' temperature at the checkpoints outside of residential buildings, grocery stores, and public transportation stations, and by sending personnel to enter households. Keeping this mass control in mind, George wondered, how did the Canadian government manage to find so many people who voluntarily go to hospitals to be tested? George was also highly, oh, sorry. George was also highly suspicious of the Canadian notion of a voluntary self-isolation, which was later mandated by law, but not strictly enforced. In his mind, this lax state also stood in shark, um, a stark contrast with China's rigorously monitored isolation at the medical centers. George's disbelief in citizens' voluntarism was shared by individuals from other ethnic backgrounds as well. 
but it was particularly prevalent among Chinese immigrants. Another study participant of mine who had been highly critical of the Chinese government for many things now told me that she wished that the Canadian government would emulate China by implementing enforced isolation. After I explained that the Canadian government does not have as massive an administrative police system to put such strictures into effect, she answered swiftly that the GPS trackers would solve the problem. It is ironic that even as political dissidents, she and George both under the influence of a CTM, endorsed the Chinese government's authoritarian approach to COVID-19 in a time of a crisis. Indeed, motivated by a distrust of liberal citizenship, some CTM took Chinese authoritarianism as the gold standard to intervene in the host society's public health campaign. When criticizing the Canadian Health Authority's initial recommendation that healthy individuals need not wear masks, one article found the support from the National Post. And to buttress its authority, claimed that this commercial press was similar to China's People's Daily, the official newspaper of the Chinese Communist Party. Another article critical of certain non-Chinese Canadians' lack of a conformity with the government's order to stay home, posed a particularly grim rhetorical question in its title, really need the government to send tanks? The mention of a tanks makes no sense in the Canadian government, uh, in the Canadian context. But to Chinese ears, it is an immediate reminder of the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 in which tanks were famously employed in the killing of uh, thousands of protesters. The COVID-19 crisis has likely bred a kind of authoritarian thinking that dismisses human rights. Over months, as Western societies gradually escalated their policy and the legal measures against the COVID-19, a CTM article passionately claims that as the entire world enters the Wuhan lockdown mode, Westerners finally realize that human lives are more important than human rights. This concludes my presentation. I would like to thank you everyone for um, your presence and attention. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that my uh, research was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. I am very grateful to my study participants um, and I invite you to stay tuned with my full paper, which should appear in the edited volume, Coronavirus in International Media, edited by uh, Douglas V. Koch and published by Roman and Littlefield. Thank you very much. Good job, good job, good job. Sir. Okay, now I will um, stop share. Um, and uh, uh, is, uh, is the, the turn of uh, uh, Paul, uh, our third speaker, also the final one. Uh, I, I just uh, get to know Paul close very recently. Uh, uh, Paul, you have been really, really generous uh, to get this uh, uh, panel organized uh, in such a beautiful way. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. Uh, so Paul Cross uh, teaches uh, history and American studies at uh, Stetson University, Florida, on topics with the deep values issues that the manners experts say not to bring up at the dinner table, including science and religion, war and peace, environmental debates, medical controversies, political polarization, media and the public sphere, race relations, the American Civil War, and the 1950s and the 1960s. Here we can see uh, what, what a, a great uh, breadth that Paul has been working in. The American philosopher and the psychologist is a good intellectual guide for thinking across differences. And his second book, Young William James Thinking, published by Hopkins two years ago, tells the story of his early intellectual development. Uh, Paul's webpage, Public Classroom, combines his interest in learning and teaching with essays on issues of public concern. Let's welcome Paul. Thank you, Zed, and thank you, James. Thank you both for your presentations. 
uh, I'm showing my age here. Uh, I bring you not images, but the spoken word. And uh, it may not be poetry, but I offer you 15 minutes toward a big rethink. In particular, my teachable moment here is about how the pandemic can prompt a rethink of the American dream. But really, looking at history, the American dream has always been about more than just acquisition of more material stuff. The American dream circulated before the phrase was coined in 1931 by historian James Truslow Adams. Avant la lettre, as they say in Paris, Americans and their admirers around the world believed that in this land, without the confining impediments of traditional hierarchies, the poor could rise in station based on their own abilities and hard work. Adams expressed confidence, even at the outset of the Great Depression, that the traditional American social dynamics for improving one's station in life applied to any and every class. But these opportunities mostly went to white Protestants. Displaced natives and enslaved African Americans lived with the cruelest opposite of the American dream. Their abilities brought sneers and their hard work rarely brought rewards. Now, massive surges in unemployment brought by the COVID-19 pandemic with an increase in US jobless rates by clock it here, 3000% in about a month, means that many American workers, even when not put down by prejudice, have worked hard, but still cannot reap the fruits of the American dream. The equation of the American dream with money and material acquisition, however, misses a deeper sense of what the phrase has meant. Enter the COVID pandemic, which provides an opportunity to reclaim the depths of democratic opportunities embedded in the American dream beyond constant material gain. So I start with a section that I call the American dream and American history. Throughout American history, the American dream has sometimes been supported by keeping some people out of opportunities with immigration restriction or prejudice to ensure that the fulfillment of the dream could be corralled for the, only for the most privileged. In 1964, for example, Malcolm X told a crowd, I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. The sharpness of that biting commentary shows how deeply the phrase had actually rooted in the American imagination, which Malcolm targeted for critique. The American dream had become a popular way to describe social mobility, and it has implied confidence that in this land, social context could be readily overcome, and problems were only exceptions to the opportunities and even prosperity that would readily reward one's abilities and efforts. In the US of A, your dreams would be self-made. And because American society has presented few material or cultural checks on ambitions, those dreams, dreams could sometimes soar to enormous heights, even without connection to hard work. One celebrity brashly stated recently, being paid more for being paid more than you're worth is the American dream. Now, a section on virus first contact. Environmentalists call recent times the Anthropocene era, when the when the human species has brought enormous impacts on planet Earth with climate change and loss of species, but also with enormous cultural and social achievements. Those impacts are real. But these times are also a small chapter of what could be called the micro scene, a much longer period of Earth dominance by microscopic viruses and bacteria. Compared to the successes of the human primate, these creatures are more adaptable. And as William McNeil recounts, they have had significant control over human history. Human development has even enhanced the, the strength of viruses and unhealthy bacteria, effectively creating a veritable microscene dream for microbes with limited opportunities. Countless microbes had long remained confined to local settings. 
But as human habitations have spread, greater contact with wildlife has provided these pathogens with opportunities to migrate out of their old locales. The resulting increased zoonoses, to use the biological term, diseases that are transmittable from animals to humans, in other words, make full use of modern human practices. Globalization provides, in effect, highways of transmission. And cities, crowded markets, and refugee camps increase potentials for contagion. The diseases are natural, even as human practices amplify their spread and virulence, providing what Ted Steinberg calls the unnatural components of natural disasters. Vulnerabilities now exposed. This pandemic has alerted Americans that our society might be far more brittle than we once imagined. Other colossal problems lurk, ranging from skyrocketing healthcare costs, eroding infrastructure, nuclear war, terrorist strikes, or rising sea levels, decimation of fisheries and, and arable land, toxins leaching into the waterways, and other human-made and natural disasters. Have a nice day. Uh, any one of these could disrupt the American dream even more deeply. The only strangeness of these strange times may be that it has taken so long for one of these massive disruptions to erupt on a national scale. These grim possibilities highlight that the American dream and its success stories have been skating on assumptions of a generally healthy, undisrupted, and peaceful society. Americans have faced disasters before, ranging from other epidemics, hurricanes and earthquakes, to depressions and wars. Most of them have been localized, temporary, managed, or offshore, as with almost every American war. This history has encouraged a sense that such problems are exceptions to the regular smooth operation of society, not factors to be considered seriously compared with the abundance of opportunities. Even the tens of millions of deaths worldwide from the 1918-19 Spanish flu, a largely forgotten pandemic, did not dent this powerful American self-understanding. For hundreds of years, looking past disasters has been the norm for American majorities. Americans weathered the setbacks while the dream endured because better opportunities always seem just around the corner. In other words, the key to the American dream has been growth, with each generation expecting more. Fixation on growth has been hardwired into our national policies and personal expectations. Presidential administrations are measured by their ability to generate economic growth while bigger houses and larger flat screens measure personal success. Mainstream economists can't conceive of economies that don't grow. No wonder that Americans rarely question this design feature of national self-perception. So what about politics? Well, there has been bipartisan endorsement of the American dream with its assumptions of constant growth that it has been a, it enabled the US to be simultaneously conservative and liberal at the same time. There is conservatism in the incentives for enterprising economic ventures with impulses for low taxes and reduced regulation. There is liberalism in legal support for rights for more citizens, often expressed with more material gain. These views, with accompanying ideological differences over a host of domestic and foreign policy issues, are rarely assumed to exist in sharp contrast. In fact, discussion of this polarization is the dominant storyline of our time. Yet those flares of fighting surge around a deep consensus about the American dream. Rarely have we had serious discussions about the limits to material gains, or more generously, about how that growth might be shared more equitably. Yet any portrait of a society with less striving for more and more receives bipartisan criticism. 
with conservatives taunting that without growth, enterprises will be punished and liberals relying on growth to bring more citizens into the prosperity tent. Both outlooks assume life without major disasters. Time to look squarely at the American dream, side effects and all. The American dream with its assumptions about resources readily available for human enterprises has shown little reckoning with the environmental impact of these human dreams. In fact, this traditional way of using resources displays what American philosopher and psychologist William James called a wishing cap approach to life. He referred to what we could call the apps of his time available in the early 20th century. As he said, we want water, we turn on a faucet. We want a Kodak picture, we press a button. We want information, we telephone. Fast forward a century, fancier apps. But the point is the same. The technology is indeed remarkable. Then, rather than having to think about the sources or the implications of our wishes, we hardly need do more than the wishing, as he put it. The world is rationally organized to do the rest. The system is well suited to addressing the material parts of the American dream, but does not sustain the environmental services that contribute to material prosperity and the rest of the American dream. Living with comforts, enjoyment, and creativity does require resources, but these do not need to be on enormous scales. Thomas Jefferson endorsed the virtue of what he called a middling level of development with freedom from both the pain of want and from the burdens of managing extensive holdings. While possession of some material goods supports happy and fulfilling lives, acquisition of many more does not make us happier necessarily. In fact, acquisitiveness can even tend to undercut these goals. Work in the field of positive psychology offers a way of living with sufficient but not excessive resources. The degree of abundance actually addresses the desires of most citizens and their families, especially if other parts of their lives are fulfilling. So how to aim for an American dream, not without just more and more stuff. For the next chapter of human history, the challenge will be how to maintain the continued flow of the dream's achievements with fewer of its problems. How to cool the constant pressure for more material things, which has been tempting fate by inviting material disasters, but continue to provide broad opportunities for sufficient material resources and for enrichments of more parts, parts of life beyond the stuff. The system of constant economic growth has been wonderful, at least for many people, even as, as it has also produced enormous side effects, which do not gain as much attention as the wonders of the system. James recognized the temptation to pay attention only to the familiar. With all we already know, where we are absolutely at home. Even though this way of thinking overlooks the robust, what he called phenomenon of the whole of experience. That's just a fancy way of urging recognition of both. The outstanding achievements that result from the familiar tradition of constant economic growth and it's less acknowledged but often dreadful other side effects, not intended, but nonetheless very real. Imagining steps beyond the routines of constant growth can be difficult, since in the modern world we swim in its assumptions. As Tim Jackson recognizes, people who choose alternatives find themselves at odds within their own social worlds. Life with the production and consumption of constant growth is the central habit of modern times. And as James points out, once set, 
A habit serves as an invisible law as strong as gravitation, enabling efficiency and comfort, as long as they work, as long as those habits work. But our habits are not our destiny. Habits are not even permanent. As he adds, because humanity has extraordinary degrees of plasticity, possibilities abound. Most of the side effects of the American dream amplified by constant growth, are problems of scale. Each individual act of pollution, while not good, obviously, is not world destroying. But on mass scales, they can become overwhelming disasters, much like viruses expanding beyond local settings. Each bottle recycled, each errand run by car instead of on foot, each cigarette butt tossed on the ground has close to zero environmental impact. But when ignored by individuals and by systems with no incentives for healthier actions, the collective mass creates mass destruction. Yet small changes by individuals and structures can add up. As James says, there is legitimacy in some, some steps. That is true many times over in mass culture, plus, taking some small steps at a time can not only avoid some of the difficulties of change, but it can also recruit the hesitant among us who feel overwhelmed by the enormity of the problems and turn to being frozen, doing nothing. So I conclude, will America Will America, in the words often attributed to Winston Churchill, do the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives? Just as many are fond of this quotation, the sooner more can rally to finding riches beyond the material, the sooner we can figure out the healthier paths. With less squeezing for more and more material gain, that will turn our attention to the less material rewards of the American dream with its democratic hopes for more people to gain more uplift and its potential to enable more personal development, healthier social relations, and more creativity unhitched to the need for lots more things. When Americans have worked hard, they've generally expected rewards based on their own initiatives, and they've generally paid little attention to the side effects of their gains. Those expectations have been built on trust that serene, supportive settings would always endure to allow their hard work to do the work of dream building, of American dream building. The current healthcare disaster presents an opportunity to continue dreaming with less destruction, with less vulnerability to current and future crises. And now, perhaps we can turn to our far-flung audience. Good job, Paul. Thank you all. So, does, do any in our audience have questions? If not, I could start us off. I have a question for James, if I may. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Oh, you have your coffee, I see. So, okay. <laughs> um, I was struck toward the beginning of your presentation. You mentioned uh, an idea about a point at which everything becomes vulnerable. And that reminds me of a of a popular phrase, uh, turning point, or more popularly, tipping points. And uh, is it your perception that, is with your research on Piaget and, and Wink, that we're reaching a tipping point, perhaps either to listen to the likes of them or a tipping point in some other direction you might talk about? What Paul, do you think of this is a tip? Yeah, thank you for the tipping question. Point. Yeah, it's amazing how, you know, listening to both of, uh, of you, Zed and you, and how our research, the wisdom of putting three of us here in this group. So I, I just, 
I, I, I mean, from experience, we've seen how this pandemic has really affected everything, everything in life, to the point that, um, you know, not just the society, but individuals have mm -hmm. reached a certain point where, you know, where, which direction were we heading? What can we do at this time? So it's not just waiting for the government to do this. Each individual is looking at it. And that's the more reason I was referring to religious minded who, who are also part of the society. So I think we've reached this point where, um, like I mentioned, Socrates words, man, know thyself. So we have that in introspection. We look again inward and then begin to see where we can head to. So it's a, it's a, it's, you, you said it so beautifully, the, new, the next chapter, the next mm -hmm. chapter of human history, the next chapter of individual life. And it ties in so beautifully with your American dream analysis, so beautifully. Mm -hmm. So we we'll reach this point where what we had already had as a predisposition, and in my own case, I was emphasizing the societal, like so many things happen in the third world, which are different from the first world, which are different from the developed nations. Do you see how this virus just crumbled everything down? Everything in its unique nature in these societies. So, um, you know, what are we looking at? We are looking at how to get back up. And while um, there is rich optimism in all our, our presentations, I still believe that this is a time for each society to do some homework, homework for itself, and then we can get back up for the next chapter. Thank you so much for that question, Paul. You know, I'm struck with, with your response that, that, that you see more hope in individual action, or use the fancy word agency, than in uh, waiting for government action. It's, a, it's on the spectrum of what what we historians call uh, this, how does history change through individual action or through structural change? It sounds like you're, you're putting a big vote for, for lots of individuals to realize it's on them. It's on yeah. individual. Yeah, Paul, Paul, I, I like to, I, I, I wouldn't, I would not take your bait, bait, <laughs> because of this distinction between this and this. Even when I was talking about individual, social and societal, Sometimes mm -hmm. it's difficult to make the distinction. For instance, in, in, in the realm of language, we are living mm -hmm. the societal, we are living in it. So, so where is our individual voice? But then personally, when I watch the news, I see like the president talking from political point of view. I see people like Dr. Anthony Fauci talking from the health department. Mm -hmm. Like these are heads, these are experts in different fields. But then you see how they, they navigate among politics, among expertise and common sense. And that common sense means that even individuals, and that's why even when things are open up, like you said earlier on before the presentation, the beaches can be opened up, but we need our common sense. Are we going to use it? <laughs> is it, yeah. is it, is it? Uh, mandatory for all of us. So individuals cannot just sit aloof from all these individuals, agency. Yeah. And, and you know that my cultural background affects me a lot. Agency is not something that we talk about in community oriented cultures of the third world. So agency, if agency is born out of this situation, I will be very happy, both academically and experientially. Yeah. And didn't you use the word balance in your presentation? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so maybe the in my what you call my my baiting phrase, individual or structural. Your word yeah, balance would be the answer. We need both. <laughs> balance, exactly. Yes, you're right. We need both. You're right. And your your example of the beaches is a good one because you can have a rule <laughs> yes. about beaches, but individuals need to use common sense as well. well exactly. Exactly, yeah. Paul, Paul. I also have a question for Z. Yeah, Z, Z met mention of uh, human life, human life, and human right. 
And again, this is the distinction that I always want to avoid. So, so I've said met, mention of that, and in the context of um, all the politics, transnational issues, I'm looking at the fact that even on human rights, even when you are dealing with human rights, the right to life is the first. So how do you make that distinction, saying, saying that human life and human right? For me, you know, human right, human right to life is even the first. So I, I just need a little bit more on that distinction between life yeah, and I, right. I, 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 totally, I totally see why you are puzzled. It's, it's, it's a great question. And I'd like to clarify that it was not my statement. I was uh, quoting a uh, CTM, Chinese transnational oh. media. And it oh, is okay. uh, uh, particularly uh, disturbing to me. Uh, but it does speak to something about the context, about the uh, ongoing COVID crisis that, that, that we're experiencing. And uh, my argument um, is that, uh, you know, this kind of authoritarian thinking, uh, this utilization of the state of exception to assert the superiority of authoritarian regime uh, just uh, um, become very conveniently voiced uh, within this the, the, the context that 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 we're going through. Okay, so, totally so that's understand. Already, yeah, yeah, totally understand. Like what Paul was asking me, you know, I I see how um, I see how this pan pandemic affects everything, everything from human to the natural world and all that you can think of. But I am always tempted to always look at like that area that you, you are focusing on, the Chinese, especially that, that point where the Chinese flag and the American flag representing like the Asian, uh, uh, I mean, achievement and the um, Western achievement kind of. I, this, is, this is my bias, this is my bias. In terms of the virus and all the accusations and counter accusations, I still see deep within all that the, the tendency of the human being, which is that which is going to my own area, the tendency of human beings to look beyond themselves. So again, what Paul said about agency and and, and structures. So if you begin to look at the counter accusations on the path to genesis of this virus it might take us a long time to get over it and to rebuild a world. And that can spiral into um, lopsided trade, kind of after this COVID-19, the transnational trade deals, how is it going to affect poorer countries like African countries and all that? Because when two elephants fight, when two elephants fight, the saying goes, it is the grass that suffers. So I'm always concerned about <laughs> the victim yeah. of all the fights in this issue. Maybe not a question, but I'm just like, was just looking at that. Yeah, actually, by, uh, uh, by the way, I just want to mention that I saw a question addressed to all of us by uh, Babbitt. And, and it's actually very similar to the question that you raised uh, here, uh, mm. James. So uh, allow me to read that for everybody. How does one, and many have raised this question, negotiate the difference between the first world and the so-called third world and the, the way the pandemic is negotiated, but also the astonishing uniformity in the responses across the <laughs> board, across the globe? Interesting. So, yeah. Um, you're uh, definitely thinking toward the same yes. direction. Yes. Yes. And if I may attend, or Paul, you want to say something about the question? Yeah, go ahead. After you okay, well, I was looking at, I was looking at um, an exceptional article that a German author, a psychologist, who did some extensive, extensive in, in Nigeria, in places that I can relate to. So she said something about Africa and Nigeria particularly, how they import things that the, the citizens don't even need because we want to measure up to the standard of the first world. And of course, that made me think of the term of, I mean, the beginning of global, global culture and all that and how it connects with business. So, so, so but this lady, a, a, a psychologist from Germany said something like Africa and development 
and and things that touch my heart it, it it could take the next century to even stand on our ground because of the quest to belong we want nigeria is the 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 the, the best economy in africa and we want to tie up with the first world and in the quest to measure up to the global global scene we forget about the citizens so we can just import things so after this chapter after this the next chapter of my so the if the agency and what i mean by agency is that the, the ability of the citizens to speak for themselves which is um a utilization of the fact that the european culture the western culture came during colonialism so we are not just a community oriented culture but a culture that has been con influenced by individualist thinking from the west so if the agency of the individual is not strengthened Africa might suffer more and more and more after this pandemic because China and the West, the, the dumping ground, in quote, is always Africa. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Paul had uh, uh, really, really uh, a lot of insights to share, but can I just uh, quickly go before you, Paul? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I recognize the difference between uh, the situations of the first first world and the third world to be a serious one. And I think there are uh, many layers to this problem, you know, in terms of the media, we don't see a lot of uh, coverage about yeah. what has been going on in the third world country. Uh, you know, maybe it's just because of media, maybe it's because of the lack of uh, uh, testing facility. And uh, uh, psychologically, I know many people, including a lot of my students, who just said they kind of uh, stopped uh, uh, reading news or maybe li limiting to news reading to several minutes every day because they are emotionally tried. I think this uh, we are having a shock response globally. In you know, other other countries are in a, in a, in a panicky state, and uh, initially there uh, some countries just try to stock uh, uh, stockpile their medical resources. Um, but I can also see the other side of the story after we. Um, uh, we kind of calm down and uh, uh, have a time to reflect what has been going on. We can gradually discover the the, the, the positive things uh, inside of uh, uh, people's heart and and, and okay. dream, as uh, Paul and the James have uh, beautifully said. You know, there are agencies people people care about others who are suffering. You know, there are some. Uh, um, human connections that cannot be uh, fully blocked by uh, by political struggles or 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 lack of empathy. Um, but I, I guess I guess is it's not a naturally occurring process. It requires the the work uh, of all of us. We we need right. to make that happen. Mm. And and with right. that, I will I I I'd like to hear uh, what Paul has to say. Yes. Um. Yeah, thank you, Babette. Bob, it's a, a wonderful question. And I'm going to start with the, your powerful phrase there, astonishing uniformity. And that the astonishing uniformity is not only reflected in the responses to this pandemic, but it's been part of the, the march of Western civilization, of course, and bringing so much uniformity across the world. And uh, in, in terms of the language we've been using in the preceding few minutes before this question, you could set that in contrast with the agency that we've been talking about, that James uh, just mm -hmm. articulated, that Zed just came to. And so in a sense, the, the pandemic presents at once another, another layer of that uniformity, uh, drawing on my paper that the, the ways in which globalization contributed to the unleashing of, of viruses in local settings. That would be an example of the, the, the globalization uniformity contributing to the problems. And uh, Zed just referred to the ways in which media, I think it was Zed, who referred to media that weren't paying much attention to other words, other stories, uh, past the astonishing uniformity of, of so much of the media. And I'm re reminded of, of the, uh, the media studies observation that, that we have we have uh, many diverse stories in our, in our prominent media and mainstream media, but they tend to be about a uniform assumptions. So it's many different individual stories, but they're all in a broader sense, 
like repeating the same kinds of things. I mean, a, a sort of a joking way to put this is that we're, we're dealing with massive versions of Coke versus Pepsi. It's like, oh, well, can we notice that when, when the media is asking us to choose among differences that we're hearing, that we're you know, basically talking about different versions of sugar water. And, and so um, your, your question points us to both the ways in which the current problem is a, a continuation of, of previous problems, kind of pops out of aspects of previous problems, uh, is contributing to um, their, their reinforcement and maybe around the edges, including some of the things that we've been talking about. James talking about how problems can be opportunities. Uh, Zed talking about ways in which there can be some, uh, if this is fair to say, Zed, some pushback uh, to uh, transnational media. Uh, and I was talking about ways of finding other dreamlike qualities of this land of opportunity beyond more stuff that those can be opportunities for some pushback, but it ain't gonna be easy, as William James says, and it's gonna feel like a real fight. So uh, thank you for that question. And welcome other thoughts on this from, from others in the audience or on the panel. Um, thank, thank you for your comments. I actually have a question for you. Oh, is someone else speaking? Sorry, I just didn't want to cut out any anybody else. Okay, I will I, I continue. I only hear your voice. Yes, yes. You're in the, you're in the Maybe audience? Maybe it's just dumb echo. Um, oh, it's it? Yeah. Okay. My question is, uh, okay, I'm speaking from outside of uh, uh, the United States, not super familiar with everything, uh, but uh, during your presentation, I get the, uh, the, the, the I, I started to wonder maybe uh, the American dream get a partially reincarnated into the idea of uh, make America great again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I wonder uh, if you could uh, comment on the, the connection between the two and, and, and the, the potential, maybe potential danger of that, because apparently, uh, you know, the past three years, uh, America failed to be made great again, and, and that, it, you know, what's going on has been totally shocking and, and saddening to me, so yeah, I'm concerned yeah. about that. Be, before, well, before Paul, yeah, be, before Please. you respond, yeah. mm -hmm. is this not part of the conversation in on the dinner table? Just kidding. <laughs> the conversation oh, you want, you want the to values avoid questions? at the dinner table. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. right. Go ahead. The, the, the values experts tell you don't bring it up. It might upset Aunt, 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 Aunt Julie and Uncle that Frank. That might be the or, end of dinner. Yeah, right, right. Everyone has indigestion over this. Yes. Go well, ahead, in my I, I, one of the projects I'm working on now, I characterize my, a number of different projects I'm working on now under the umbrella phrase of learning from people in disagreement. So, I try to listen to those aunts and uncles who have views that might look like they're from hell. And I try to listen to them and go, oh, that's interesting. And what would the world look like if we continue to pursue in that direction? Hmm. So th this leads directly to Zed's question. What are the connections between this history of the American dream with its emphasis on material prosperity and the, the current president with his emphasis on making America great again, which is his, 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 his headline for a series of policies that in effect enact that material part of the American dream. He's not very interested in looking at, at diverse dimensions of the American dream about creativity, about diverse social relations. He's not, he's not interested in those dimensions of it. So I would say to go directly to your, to your question, Zed, that the current administration in Washington is very much interested in promoting that traditional picture of the American dream. And uh, uh, it's something that appeals to a good 40% mm, of the American population in a, in a very firm way. It appeals to another between 10 and 15% in a less firm way. And I guess this fall, we'll just see where the chips fall on, on that. Uh, so this is pre precisely why I'm not interested in presenting a challenge to the American dream that says, oh, okay, drop it. We, we cannot continue the American dream. It has failed no more. To me, I'm interested in parsing apart 
what are the material elements of the American dream that said, I want to be paid more than my work than I'm worth? Or I need to get as much as possible and, you know, devil take the hindmost on, on uh, whether, I don't know if Wink would have a saying on that, uh, devil take the hindmost on, on uh, anyone else. I'm interested in pulling apart that aspect of the American dream and the part of the American dream that says we have opportunities for more people whose lives have been tamped down by hierarchies. That's the, that's not instead of the American dream. It's a it's embedded in the American dream, and it it's it's a hopeful prospect that doesn't have to be instead, and it might open possibilities to make America better, whether that satisfies those who are looking for greatness or not. It's it might we might need some different hats and say make America better. Well said. Well said, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's very helpful. So uh, once again, we need to learn from uh, uh, James' idea of uh, uh, paying attention to the phenomena of the whole experience. It, right. it reminds me of mm -hmm. the motto of the French Revolution, uh, liberty, equality, and uh, solidarity. So it seems mm -hmm. the current version of American dream has given too much emphasis to liberty while ignoring the other two parts. And I'm really mm -hmm. grateful that you are uh, working the other out. And, and also the fact that you are moving beyond the human society, but also think about uh, uh, the human and, and, and the na nature relationship um, mm -hmm. under the term of uh, uh, human perceive and, uh, and uh, uh, micro perceive. I, I really like that phrase. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank, well, thank unfortunately, you, those other critters don't vote. And so there's a lot of what environmentalists call downstreaming of problems. You send it downstream to those who don't vote, like other river systems or water systems, or you send it downstream to another country where well, they're not in our system, so they don't vote. Or you send it downstream to the, ne to the next generation, because, well, they're going to vote in 20 years and we'll sort it out later. So there's a lot of downstreaming. And if we can just stop and think about, you know, what's going on upstream before we send it downstream, I think exactly. we can have a, a healthier society. And that talks to the politics of representation, whose mm. voice, whose voice is heard, and who is making these policies, and who is benefiting. And honestly, like, like Zed, I, even though I spent a, a good number of my adult years in America, I sometimes look at it from an outsider perspective. And this is what, what, what I, I would say my own definition of America and something like um, something that I would want to and I, I would want to envy. I mean, I envy, in, I mean, being that I've been in two worlds and especially this ties into your project, Paul. The mm -hmm. fact that what is happening in, in, in the outside world is happening in the academia. That is to say, you don't have this huge divide between academia, between, mm -hmm. between education and the street. So for me, for me, that's the, the greatest thing, the greatest thing, maybe because I'm, I'm, I'm tilting towards um, uh, education. So that's the greatest thing I've, I've seen in America, that you are mm -hmm. able to take American dream that I first heard in the political scene, that you've been able to take it to the academia and dissect mm -hmm. it and analyze it and, spa and pass it to the clearer understanding of not just Americans, but outsiders. So that, mm -hmm. that's the most amazing thing I have seen in America. Mm -hmm. And from a culture that's just distinguishing academia, just making it look like, okay, there's a title connected to politics and not connected to the, to the real life of the people. Again, the agency of the real people whose voice are not heard. That mm -hmm. is the people, those are those, those are the population that suffers when yeah. these things are going downstream. Policies of representation, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like your ideas about representation and also about the divide between, how did you put it, academia and the street. <laughs> yes, Because exactly. I think some of the problems we face are not just from those who are, who are speaking with Ballyhoo about <laughs> making America great again. It's also the ways in which some of the most learned among us are speaking in ways that is difficult for general audiences to understand. 
Right. And that's an open invitation for them to listen to populist leaders who say, I'll give you something you can understand. How about this? How about fighting against those immigrants? How about agitating a, a, against people who aren't really the sources of the problem, but if it's clear, it might persuade more. Well, mm. what about the potential for academics with all of their high octane intellectual apparatus and all of their learning, just not to spend all their time, but to spend some of their time speaking in more, more communicable ways. Um, so it's it's something that in 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 my in my old age I'm I'm heading to uh, I start I started a web page that I called the public classroom with just this purpose. It's a modest effort and I haven't made a penny from it, but it's just a public service to try to figure out how can we translate from the world of academia that's full of ideas that are often ignored right. to the world of public culture that has so many questions that could be addressed by those insights, but instead are addressed by, by populist leaders who fill in the gap, because a lot of times intellectuals don't step up to the plate. Absolutely, so, You're right. You're um, right. That's just one modest effort, and I hope more academics can, can step up and, and uh, not instead of their academic yeah. discourse, but, right. Uh, right. but step beyond their discourse, <laughs> even that word. Right. <laughs> Which, Paul, you know, just as a friendly yeah. reminder, it just, yeah. it just means talk. It just means right. talk. Right, Paul, right from my undergraduate classes in America, that has, even though I praise America for connecting with the street, uh, academia on the street, but that's, mm -hmm. that, was, that was also my first observation. A huge, a huge learning materials right in the four walls talk, and it's not given an outlet to the street. But Paul, about your right. public classroom, that's also my dream. I have a name. I have a name for that, which is could be the similar M. Like okay. Let me, let hey, we can work what, together. Yeah, okay. Let see, let's let do some teamwork. Yes, yes. Let's see what okay. that says. Yeah. And you're not oh, going to tell us your name, or you have to kill us. Right? Has, um, sorry, I was cutting off someone else. Okay. Okay. okay I will continue. Paul, well, since you are a historian, you know your comment about the divide between academia and the street reminds me of a saying I think popular in history is that uh, you know the only thing that we learn from history is that we never learn from it you know we uh, <laughs> sometimes yeah. in, you know when working inside of academia we know terrible things are going to happen and, and then we try to make a little bit of voice and nobody really care about us and we just mm -hmm. uh, desperately see what's going to be happening, right? So um, yeah. I think I, I really strongly resonate with, with your initiative and mm. with your call that we need to yeah. uh, reach out and you know, you know, having, having dialogue not only with our colleagues, but also to uh, yeah. people uh, from well all corners of, of life. That's well put. And uh, your comment said, reminds me of a, a comment from uh, the American theologian and and political thinker Reinhold Niebuhr, who said, the only empirically verifiable biblical commentary is sin. <laughs> We've got lots <laughs> of evidence of that all over the place. Um, so, you know, people will reliably do all kinds of nasty things, uh, that's for sure. Um, but this is precisely why I'm attracted to this wise guy, William James, because he puts stock in what he calls some. Some. Like, it doesn't mean we have to change the whole world tomorrow. Whew, that sounds so tiring. Um, right. But instead, we, he, he coined a word for this, which I didn't use in the presentation. He coined the word meliorism. And what he means by that is that we can ameliorate things. We can take one step at a time. We can do some things. And by gum, if you do something, and someone else sees it and it makes sense, then maybe we can use some of this mass culture that's been hurting us so much. Maybe we can use some of this mass culture to improve things and actually have people begin to lift boats together if we can get enough communication across the line. It's, it's uh, someone used the phrase optimism about our presentations. Uh, James's meliorism is an address to that because he said, I'm not an optimist, but I'm not a pessimist. I'm a meliorist. It's, it's a work in progress. Yes. And it, it could bomb. 
I, I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me that when I uh, write my paper, I just want to make it super clear that even I'm criticizing a, a par part of uh, transnational uh, Chinese media. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to just uh, entirely dismiss this thing because mm -hmm. there's a uh, mm -hmm. potential to use it uh, uh, for the for 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 better, and and that uh, touches on James' comments on human agency. I guess mm -hmm. we just we need to keep the conversation going on. Maybe not at the dinner table, but but <laughs> we need to be doing that. Well, yeah. at the dinner table, we can listen, and yeah, elsewhere exactly. we can talk. <laughs> but at least listen. Um, but I I see here come the judge. Here come the judge. Tim is here. Here comes the authority figure. Um, I just, I, I but Tim, the video because technically okay. speaking, the, the time for the panel is over. But as I said before, okay. if you want to take uh, a few more minutes to, to finish yeah. your thoughts, um, okay. uh, you, can, you can do that and work that out amongst yourself. That's, I see there are seven fun. attendees, and I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to hear what others in attendance might say or question about what we've been well, the quest, the Q and A is still open. If anybody wants to ask a question, as long as as we're still here, we're we're still looking at the Q and A. But I actually had a thought, as I'm not a psychologist, maybe I'm I'm one of the uh, good person to look at, uh, as you said, the the difference between academia and street. So um, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I am studying, but not psychology, not the not the right field. But you also talked about positive psychology, and as I understand it, in positive psychology, a big part or one of one big idea is the the more conscious way of thinking about gratitude. Do you think mm -hmm. that this whole pandemic, as everything is kind of, especially in the Western country, or yeah, especially in the Western countries, those luxury things as going to the beach are not as not so much a given anymore. Do you think that's that's also an opportunity for experiencing mm -hmm. gratitude? And maybe then, in in turn, when you talk about the American dream, give mm -hmm. uh, give more gratitude towards what we have instead of what we could have if we get more than we are worth. Yeah, yeah. It, if you guys don't mind, I have a I have a quick thought on that uh, on gratitude and. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's an important analog or implication of positive thinking. And it brings up how the, the attitude of gratitude is often criticized for being overly optimistic. And you might know the phrase Pollyanna-ish, you know, like, like, oh, everything's so nice. I'm gratitude, I'm gratitude for everything. Uh, but I have a different attitude about gratitude. My perspective is that at any one moment, lots of things are going on. Some good, some bad, some things, sometimes it's a lot of bad. Uh, and you know, this, this situation is pretty bad. But if it can bring up an attitude of gratitude, to me, it, the point of that attitude is not to say, oh, how jolly things are. It's to say, what's going well, while these other things aren't, what's going well that gives me a platform, a lever, to do other things. To me, the attitude of gratitude is not about being, oh, so nice, how nice things are. Instead, the attitude of gratitude is literally, it's saying, you've been gifted with this by faith. Now, what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna use it? What can you do with that? What possibilities can emerge? While, you're, while your one gifted thing is surrounded by all these other things, what can you do? What's your contribution? So uh, to me, your point about attitude of gratitude is a wonderful one. It follows from the positive psychology, but I, but I just think it's so important to, to amend the, 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 the street reputation <laughs> of the attitude of gratitude as being only about uh, being Pollyanna and being optimistic about everything. And I have an attitude of gratitude for all of you uh, on this panel. Do you have other thoughts on gratitude or other things related to this? Yeah. yeah you, you just said everything beautifully. I, I don't have yes. anything to add. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say that, you know, um, when I came to the, uh, to the U.S. and saw all the things, the glories and all that, and how um, 
people still long for more like in material aspect and then mm. this was an opportunity for me to weigh between my background and, to, and you know, make my judgment um how grateful am i to even be here <laughs> to even be here to see and not just to seek for acquisition of all these materials which you know kind of good but but you know i i, I like that question that tim says because you know, um, the beaches, the houses of worship, every place social, you know, we affected and nobody went out. And then I don't know what went on in the minds of people, whether they were protesting to go back there, defending their rights to do this or to do that, whether they had time to appreciate the fact that they are even alive or things like that, knowing that this virus has affected so many things, so many people's lives have been ended. So it's an interesting thing to look at attitude of gratitude. Well, James, if you have gratitude for, for this opportunity you have now in graduate school, then the next question is going to be, okay, there's a lever. How are you going to use it? So exactly. no pressure, know. no pressure, know. but you know, know. It, it's an opportunity. All Definitely. these things you have gratitude for present opportunities. Yeah. Definitely. Paul, I, I didn't mention this. You say you, you have your public class. And I want to say something. I want to. I want to have the name. I want to give my own is land, land from land. You have land, land diversity. Right? From land, you add like it's like land and diversity. It's like mm -hmm. it's like saying I want to take the university to the land, to the people, mm. to my mother and grandmother who never had the opportunity to come this far in education. Yeah. So I listen to them. So that I, I look at the resources. Like you said, it's not just me popping up somewhere. It's all the resources that have made me who I am, which our culture doesn't look at. So, yeah. so I'm looking at the, the, the name, Land Diversity. We, we uh, have a lot to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. we can keep yeah. this going. And you, yeah. might, you might know the, the work of Wendell Berry. He talks a lot about land and the importance uh -huh. of a sense of place. What's the name? <laughs> Yeah, Wendell, Wendell Berry, yeah. B -E -R -R -Y. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, we can talk more. Yes, um, yes, yes. But that's a nice idea about land, because yeah. uh, as the, as our grandparents used to say, you know, that they're, they're not making any more land. <laughs> you know. <I> know. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, with global warming, we might be taking away land. But exactly. but in other words, the idea that it it is a it is a it is a uh, uh, a, a kind of fixed element, even as we may grow and seek other things and build buildings on the land and, and do various mm -hmm. things on the land, but the, the land is a fixed element. And how are we gonna, how are we gonna make sure that, that it continues in health? Right. Because it's, it's like, uh, when you think of a building, it's like our foundation mm -hmm. on which so much else grows and so much else can be built. Right, exactly. In British Columbia, there is a strong uh, indigenous uh, culture, and uh, mm -hmm. the idea that we're getting here is, uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, um, uh, land ownership is is mm -hmm. a very modern capitalist idea. And uh, what, what we're learning from the um, indigenous community here is that we need to appreciate our opportunity to be able to uh, live mm -hmm. on the land, and we need to take care of it, take care of everything mm -hmm. that. Uh, share the space with us and, and also mm -hmm. uh, you know to 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 have this kind of a uh, um spiritual connection with it not just in in a utilitarian way to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to resource it right it's kind of a seventh generation attitude don't just think about what's going to help you now but how will this action impact down generations mm -hmm. um, it also reminds me of uh, the the radio interview show uh, on being they always introduce themselves in terms of where they are, you know, like your idea of land, James, where you are. And they, they introduce themselves in terms of where they are, not by name of state or country, but by which indigenous people had been there. So I greet you not from Florida, but from Seminole and Tamaquin land. So it's a, it's a reminder of the, the people who, who had been here. And there was some, there was some, very unpleasant history that mm -hmm. lies in in my own mm -hmm. my own cultural backpack and in all of our backpacks uh, right. that have brought us to the present and we can't change those in an instant but at least we can start by being aware 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Then it's not something we can just uh, take over and uh, erase all the memories about uh, about it from it. Mm -hmm. um, and and what's going on with the, with the COVID nineteen crisis is that as human beings. Uh, pause their activities. We see a return of wild animals, right? The the, the land is yeah. allowing uh, its its other children to return, and and it's 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 a, such a an, another teachable moment as yeah. you know, we're all. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard similar things about how birds seem to be singing more loudly, but but I heard an ornithologist who said that's not actually true. It's just that we're quieter. <laughs> so they <sing. laughs> absolutely so we're, we're less noisy <laughs> so all of a sudden we're hearing more more of those other our our, our fellow fellow yeah. fellow earthlings right. it must have been very annoying <laughs> <laughs> to the birds to other animals <laughs> yeah yeah. It reminds me of a cartoon I saw that is a take take off on the the usual Christmas card that has you know peace on earth goodwill to men, mm -hmm. and it it has pictures of all these creatures and it says um, peace on earth goodwill to squirrels peace on earth good, <laughs> goodwill to to wrens <laughs> peace on earth goodwill to snakes <laughs> so so they wishing are some shares goodwill. of the land they're, they're they, shares they of have... the land. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So wake up. Wake up. We right. we ain't here alone. And just because they're not good at trigonometry or, you know, uh, accounting doesn't mean that they don't have their own languages and their own cultures and their own needs and their own hopes. Um, they just don't articulate them in the same way we do. Right. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> All right, so we have a Slack for, for any further conversations, any further questions that um, can be asked and answered and discussed there as well. And well I just have one quick thought. And, and uh, I've characterized to my, my wonderful fellow uh, session mates that we were in effect, all of us talking in different versions of a teachable moment that this brings in Absolutely. media, in religion, in cultural habits. And I'm also reminded, especially from Zed's presentation, that a lot of what we're talking about has to do with, with what s social commentators and, and cultural theorists call civic culture. The potential for civic culture to bloom and that that civic culture can bloom beyond just profits. It's not instead of profits, but can bloom beyond just profits. It gives potential to be aware of of uh, Wink's idea of treating disasters as learning experiences. It gives opportunities for media to communicate in different ways than just, okay, we've got to do authoritarian or we're going to collapse. And we've got mm -hmm. opportunities to rethink the American dream. So I think a lot of what we're talking about is not just teachable moments, but teachable moments about the life of civic culture. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. All right. Right. Thank you for summarizing that so beautifully. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. That's, uh, Occupational hazard. That's a very, <laughs> very nice uh, finishing touch. So yeah. I, uh, I'd like to thank you all three. It was a very interesting um, panel, and all the, you all three had very interesting presentations. Thank you, Tim. And Thanks, Tim. Well. Ensuring this session. Thank you for all the, our uh, great panelists and and uh, and other participants for stayed to now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to all the attendees wherever you in the world you may be. So thank you, everyone. To together for this. Okay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, my fellow pa panelists. This is opening up a window where I can email you and send you messages, and then I could look at your presentations and and um, publications. Is that that sounds good. For new collaboration. Thank you. That all. sounds good. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great to continue this. Let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, we will. We will. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>